Well, we've got a really exciting panel today on cybersecurity. Uh, this is something near and dear to every one of us. If you have one of these in your pocket, it is right there in your wheelhouse and something that's affecting you. But before we get on with cybersecurity, uh, many of you, I'm sure, know about the Salvation Army and the Red Kettle Campaign. Salvation Army does a lot of wonderful things for St. Louis and the community, as well as the nation as a whole. So we wanted to give Tom Kovac an opportunity this morning to talk a little bit about this. One of the lesser known facts is that the Red Kettle Campaign is still going on. So after the bell ringers disappear for the year, uh, the campaign still goes on for another month till the end of January. And it's a very crucial time for them, for them to help meet their goals for the year. So we want to invite Tom today to talk a little bit about Salvation Army and some of the things that are going on. So a round of applause for Tom, please. Thanks, Tom. So, many folks ask us, what does the Salvation Army do? And a lot of people say, how do I contribute money to the Red Title campaign? How do I help people in need? Well, what we do is when people need assistance, they come to the Salvation Army. And they say, I need help. What we do is we just do not hand them money. We hand them a path of hope. So recently, on December 25th and 26th and 27th, about 400 people, about 15 miles south of here, lost everything. They were already going through crisis. They were already going through tragedy. They lost jobs. They were struggling. And their homes were struggling. What we're doing at the Salvation Army right now is tomorrow at 11 a.m. we will be down in Arno helping those folks with vouchers for food, for clothing, and for Christmas gifts that they lost. Ladies and gentlemen, these folks lost everything. And the Tree of Lights campaign only can be successful with your support. So we're giving each family a $250 voucher approximately. A lot of folks say, well, what does someone who needs help look like? About four years ago, I was in Java, and I encountered this little girl. Everyone deserves a second chance, not to mention the first. This old child, home was destroyed in Java, Missouri. We fed her breakfast, lunch, and dinner until she found a home and was reunited with her. Salvation Army covers Missouri and the needs of Southern Illinois as well. What we're asking for you today is to please look on your table. You'll see the Salvation Army Tree of Life's Pleasure. I'm asking everybody right now to do one of two things. A, fill out that pledge form. Tell me you're going to make a gift today, your credit card, or you're going to go online and write down your pledge form and tell me your name. $50 today helps a child, just like her, who is now in Arno, 15 miles south of here. Every single dollar you give stays local. So I just want to stress, every single dollar that you give today, we really hope you go, look at that place you want to think about what you want to contribute to children and families and veterans who we serve in St. Louis. Secondly, how many of you are Blues fans? Anybody? We got some Blues fans here. We're going to be ringing bells outside of that trade center on Tuesday, January 12th, before the Blues Ottawa game. I have CBS Radio Town who will be ringing bells. They're looking for four people to ring bells with them. If I can get four people to ring bells from 5 30 to 7 30 to help children, families, and veterans, I will be here. I'd like to see you ring the bell. I do not want anybody. Who is just going to ring the bell? I want you to be excited. Can we get excited people in here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a dead child. Y'all are excited. Listen, we're going to talk about security today. We've got a great panel today. Talk about the security and investment in security of children and families. <clears throat> Please make a donation. Think about what you would like to do. I'll be here through 9 o'clock ish today. Thank you very much. You guys are a great group. Love MML. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. So it's a, a really 
worthy cause. Uh, something that we decided to do at Swift Systems this year is uh, we distributed angel tree tags to anybody who could take one. So an angel tree tag lists the person, what they really need, um, what they really want for Christmas. And uh, our staff really stepped up and everybody grabbed an angel tree tag and went out and made some of this Christmas really special. So just another opportunity at the end of this year too. So a uh, great organization and thanks for taking the time to come out some. All right, let's get into our panel. So uh, we have three distinguished experts here today, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk to you about cybersecurity and the risk involved in how to protect yourselves. First is Tony Mender. Tony is the Director of Sales Engineering for Windstream Central Region. Tony has been in the telecommunications industry since 1993. He has held numerous roles in sales operations and sales engineering during his time in the industry. Tony leads a pre sales engineering organization consisting of 43 people across 11 states. This team is focused on helping potential and current customers design as well as implement secure, converged data and voice networks. Tony resides in Waterloo, Illinois, and is a graduate of Missouri State University. Tony, if you could raise your hand, please. Shane Ritter. Shane is a network design specialist for mainstream. Shane has been in telecommunications since 1997 in various roles, including data voice support, <coughs> managing a data voice installation team, and pre sales engineering. Currently, Shane specializes in working in, pre in a pre sales role to help potential clients design a robust and secure converged data voice network. Shane's main experience is with IP networks, including cloud and premise based security. He will be sharing ways that businesses can help their data network, or, or, can keep their data network secure. Shane, if you could raise your hand, please. And last, Lisa, if you could raise your hand, please. Lisa is the Senior Vice President, Financial Services Manager, Director of CID Operations at Lockton. Lisa has spent over 25 years in the industry underwriting and broking executive risk lines of coverage. She has built a financial services unit for Lockton St. Louis and serves as a local liaison to Lockton's national practice group. Product speciali specializations managed by Lisa include Director and Officer Liability, Professional Liability, Employment Practices Liability, Network Security, Privacy Liability, Fiduciary Liability, Commercial Crime, and Special Crime. Lisa's responsibilities include direct supervisory duties for a nine-person team specializing in these products in St. Louis. For her direct clients, she provides marketing, placement, and servicing for all lines of executive risk products. Her range of clients include national accounts, public companies, and large private companies. So as I said, a distinguished group of experts here with a lot of experience. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Tony to kick things off. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Well, everybody, thank you guys for coming out today. Uh, we're going to, as we said, talk through some of the different aspects of security. I mean, this could go on for days if we really wanted to address everything in the conversation level. Uh, but there are a couple key points we wanted to start out with. I mean, just talking security in general and what's changed in really the past 10 years in that space, there's been very significant changes. So, right out of the box, I mean, one of the things that we talk to companies a lot about is the fact that it is a real and present threat. From a study that was done in 2015, nearly 25% of 101 CFOs that were surveyed said that uh, they are insufficiently prepared today to handle the crises that they know are out there. Less than 10% believe themselves to be well prepared. It is a very consistent message from the standpoint that we know threats are out there and it's all a matter of how, how you align and how you address those level of threats. When the industry started, and if you think about all of the environment of computer security, all those things, when the very first threats started happening, they were very simple threats. You had people like technology enthusiasts that just wanted to prove what they could do. They weren't after anything. They weren't after money. They weren't after secrets. They weren't after those things. You had phone breaker, breakers just proving again that they could modify the technology and make a difference. But everything wasn't connected. I and mean, one of the big things that continues to be a topic today is uh, a terminology of Internet of Things. I mean, everything from, you know, Refrigerators getting connected to the internet, legal way, legal way in. 
Uh, and then the other, I mean, the folks, they were all after just bragging rights. I mean, could they hack NASA? Could they hack this entity? They weren't going in to do anything, just proving they could get through the door, right? That's all changed. I mean, that's all changed substantially. Nowadays, I mean, you have crime syndicates out there. I mean, you talk about ransoms, you talk about money, you talk about taking technology and holding it hostage. Hacktivism has become one of the biggest things that we see today. Uh, you know, less in a single business entity, but all it takes is really for someone to frustrate someone over some reason, whatever that may be, for people to come hack. I mean, we talk about anonymous, you see that on the news all the time now, right? They're hacking governments uh, and the things that happen in that world. And then, of course, corporate and government espionage. Uh, trades, and we'll talk about that stuff in a minute, but trade secrets, business processes, the things that make each of you unique in what you do, someone out there would like to know what that is and find a way to duplicate it. How big is the threat? Uh, PwC and CIO, CSO magazines did a study in 2015. They surveyed 97 business executives. Uh, when examined, they basically said three quarters of the, of the industrial manufacturing company surveyed detected incidents over the past 12 months. Three quarters. 20% said they, they had 50 or more events. And 18% said there were between 10 and 49 events that they detected on their network in some place. When asked to identify the sources, this is where part of it gets very interesting. 36%, the largest percentage, was, was employees in the business. Disgruntled employees, peace. There's so many different areas to protect. Followed by that was former employers, competitors, and then just general hackers in general, right? Uh, and again, we can sit up here and talk about every one of these aspects. We'll go through a couple different aspects because there's just not time. Key areas specifically related to manufacturing. Again, I said it earlier. Intellectual property and trade secrets, kind of top of the list, right? I mean, someone coming in to find the documentation, diagrams, all those pieces. Manufacturing, as it is evolved, creates another level of sort of challenge as well, which is with more automation, means you're connecting more devices, more components, more things directly to networks, which now creates risk, right? Over time. Again, I say business processes, not only the intellectual property, but what makes someone unique? Why are they able to manufacture a product at a better quality or at a lesser cost? All of those are important to someone to understand what's making them different, right? And then, depending upon each person's individual business, you certainly have your own employee data, you know, social security card or social security numbers, those type of things that absolutely warrant protection. And then your own customer data, especially if you're in an environment where you're selling your product directly and you've got credit card data, and you know, all of a sudden you start taking things in the PCI world and all of those things. So you also have the, the component of being the managed customer data as well. As I said earlier, one of the uniqueness is automation, right? This, this particular slide talks about an event uh, there's so much convergence today between the network side, the IT side, and the production line side. Uh, it has to be addressed at the, at the whole enterprise level. One of the examples they used is in 2010, there was a worm called Stuxnet that was deployed. Uh, it affected a handful of different companies that basically, it entered the automation system, allowed them to shut down production lines, things like that, because once it was in, it created that evolution, and basically it was, a, it was a Windows bug entered into the Windows system, but shut down company's entire production block. Oh, hang on, that's not going to turn over to Shane here. So, as I said earlier, I mean, there's so many things we can talk about, 
and it's a fairly narrow window of time to talk today. One of the things, I mean, companies like my, like our company, Windstream, competitors to myself, I mean, we have platforms to protect networks. Firewalls exist, you know, there's manufacturers of those components. One of the hardest things for companies to protect against that we're talking today about is social engineering. Social engineering changes that dynamic, right? I can't put a program in, I can't put a platform in. It becomes employee knowledge, it becomes how do I manage my people? And so with that, I mean, Shane's gonna come up and talk a little bit about social engineering, ways to manage the social engineering, Yeah. 
the education with the employees is important. Uh, so stuff that does get through, they'll either ignore or report to the IT staff and they get that taken care of. Spear phishing, like phishing, is more of a targeted attack. So the hackers are, are the folks wanting to gain access, are aware of a group, or an individual, or a group of individuals who are specifically targeting that they know they have the information they need, and then they're going to target those folks directly. Tailgating is one that's not really of the virtual environment. You know, it's not anybody trying to get it through a computer or not trying to get it over the wire. Tailgating is following somebody into the building. They don't have badge access. They're, they're following somebody right behind somebody that badges in. They're going through the door once they're inside. You know, they have free range. They're trying to sit down at a terminal or a computer, plug a thumb drive in, something, you know, walk off with just papers. Maybe you still have stuff on, on the papers that's important. Kind of like the example Tony gave earlier, the attack example. In 2014, there was a facility in Germany, a uh, steel plant, that lost control of its blast furnace and had some pretty catastrophic damages occurred to the facility. Um, as they dug into it, they found out that it's not, not an employee error, it wasn't, it wasn't a mistake. Uh, it was a cyber attack that, that caused access to that blast furnace control system and allowed somebody to make go haywire and, and, and have a big, big issue. Uh, the specific attack vector was a spear phishing campaign. It was targeting emails that looked legitimate. When opened, they were able to filter logins and information to get into the network. <coughs> Cyber risk is one of the top concerns for manufacturers. Um, and one thing that Lisa will talk about a little bit after my presentation is they are now seeking out insurers to help manage and hand off the risk to, to somebody else to help monetarily recover. <laughs> Some tips for prevention. Uh, this is working with your employees. You know, clear guidance for employees' behavior so you can protect your corporate information. Um, locking your workstations. Uh, if you have laptops, not leaving them in the office, maybe locking them in a drawer, taking them home with you, not just leaving them out on your desk so they can walk off. You also have the aspect that's outside of work that could make its way into the work environment. You have social networking. Don't accept friend requests from folks you really don't know. Even if maybe they are a friend of a friend. You know, not sure what, what, what the reason is for, for if trying to invite you as a friend on Facebook. Facebook, other accounts, is your private setting. Privacy settings. Um, you know, you could have it wide open. Anybody in the area can go to your Facebook account and look at everything if you don't have it locked down in your private settings. Uh, share real examples of phishing emails. Uh, even report spam to your IT department. That's important. The, the IT folks will not, if they don't know about it, they don't know that they need to do something to protect against it. If you have uh, examples of other social engineering techniques that you've noticed, somebody trying to tailgate into the facility, uh, spear phishing, that also needs to be reported as well. And I think the next one is hard. Promote a culture that politely but firmly questions unusual activity. I don't think anybody wants to be rude and, and, and you know, if somebody's trying to get into the building, uh, they're trying to tailgate, you don't want to be rude and try to block somebody, but at the same time, if, if they're allowed in, you don't know what's going to happen. So I think that's, that's a good one there. You know, politely but firmly question something that maybe in your gut doesn't, doesn't feel right. Uh, constantly train your staff on cybersecurity, um, emails, uh, meetings. 
things, whether they're monthly, quarterly, uh, some semi-annual. <clears throat> and the next one's interesting. Actually test out how well your employees respond to various social engineering approaches. So um, actually put in the fact uh, ways of you know leaving that USB stick around and see if somebody picks it up and throws it and uh, puts it in their computer at work. Uh, try to tailgate it to the office and see if anybody stops you. <clears throat> and then, you know, publish results and, and tell folks how, how well they're doing. You know, that's important as well. Um, you know, you got to give feedback for folks so they know if they're doing the right thing or and you still need to make improvements. <clears throat> and then, you know, establish a routine of regular social engineering assessments with metrics. Again, it's poor feedback. It uh, allows the employees to know if they're, they're doing the right thing or not. So handling the risk of some management practices. remotely 
And the more connectivity that exists, the more risk that exists because there are different ways to get in, right? Um, so a couple of examples that were alluded to having to do with operating systems is, um, is really getting a lot of attention today with our clients. So that's kind of the physical aspect. And then the intellectual property or your corporate information, um, that obviously is very dependent upon the individual company, how much of that information you have. Is your company susceptible to you know, proprietary designs or formulas or that kind of thing that your competitors um, or foreign countries may be interested in. So again, we try to, you know, really look, every company's different in terms of their exposure, so we really kind of zero in on those various buckets and then try to advise from there. Um, so potential risk. Uh, the exposure, you know, again, starting point, we're looking at the volume of information you have. That really is going to dictate how big of a problem you have if you have a privacy or a security breach. So how many records, how much customer information. I highlight employees because uh, it was referenced on a, the PwC <coughs> survey that for manufacturers, that's a big risk. If you're a large manufacturing company, you know, whether you have 500 employees or you have 10,000 employees, that information you're holding on your employees is, is a major risk factor. And we'll talk about that in a second. You know, we list kind of the, the data that we're talking about, credit cards, social security numbers, bank account information, health records, email addresses, customer lists, it goes on and on. That definition of what PII is, personally identifiable information, and PHI, protected health information, that's the risk pool. Uh, one that most companies don't think about as much is vendor risk. I'm sure everyone in the room, when you think about your companies um, and who you outsource to, the, the point here from a cyber liability uh, standpoint is legally, even though you outsource your payroll or your data storage or an IT function, even though you outsource that to a third party, you are still the data owner. And as the data owner, legally, you're responsible if a breach occurs. So you may certainly have contractual recourse against a vendor that has a breach. Uh, but the point is, under an insurance policy, even if that vendor is the one who creates the problem and suffers the attack, your insurance policy still protects you for that. Because you may or may not, at the end of the day, you may or may not get recovery from that vendor. Okay? So that's a really important part point of the insurance policy is that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. Um, highest risk industries, retail, schools, healthcare, financial institutions, probably for obvious reasons when you think about the information that they hold. Again, manufacturers are not on that list, um, and they're not the highest, highest risk, but uh, certainly changing. Okay, on to insurance. Um, so, a cyber liability insurance policy, I, I don't know how many people in the room currently you know, purchase this coverage. I would guess, I saw a lot of you know, bankers, IT companies when I came in this morning. Um, but from a manufacturing standpoint, I would guess most in the room probably don't buy this coverage today. Like I said, you know, 18 months ago, two years ago, we, we did not have manufacturing clients buying this, but it is really changing. Uh, our larger manufacturing clients, uh, public, Manufacturing companies are, are definitely buying cyber liability today uh, because there's a better understanding of what the policy really can provide, and quite frankly, the premium for manufacturing clients is much much lower, much more reasonable um, than what you would see with a healthcare company or retail company. So, what the policy really uh, provides is kind of again four buckets: liability protection. This is is basically a suit. You know, if you suffer any kind of a privacy or security breach and your customers or your employees sue you, uh, the insurance policy is going to pay for your defense and it's going to pay for any judgments and settlements that may be rendered against you. Uh, regulatory. 
plug but one on the laptop, right? And, and nothing comes of it. There's no liability that comes from it. But because it happened and because that laptop had PII stored on it, the clock starts ticking and all the laws apply in terms of what you have to do. Um, so hiring the lawyer to figure out you know, how, you're, how you need to be in compliance with all of the laws that apply to the situation. Um, it's notification costs to your employees if there are employee files on that laptop. Uh, if it's a, a large situation, it could be credit monitoring that has to uh, be offered to all those employees. It could be an IT forensic expense, PR, you name it. The point is there's a laundry list of expenses that you may incur just because the information um, is out there. And it may not be any kind of lawsuit or liability. But those expenses are reimbursed under the insurance policy. And then last, um, you know, very, very specific to manufacturing companies is the business interruption aspect. Probably everybody in the room uh, does buy business interruption coverage under your traditional uh, property and casualty coverage. So this is the tornado or the fire um, that causes a loss of revenue and an extra expense. Um, so traditional business interruption, but chances are your business interruption does not protect you for a privacy breach or a hacker getting into your system. So you can you can purchase the uh, business interruption coverage within the cyber liability policy as well. And this is what we're talking about at the beginning: the physical assets, the operating systems, uh, the German steel mill, um, you name it. But if something happens to your operating and it takes you down. Um, this can, can reimburse for the extra expense and the loss uh, loss income. Okay. So just a, a couple more quick comments on the coverages that I just spoke of. Uh, the, the main point on this slide is for people to understand the difference between security breach and privacy breach. I think everybody understands security breach. You know, the bad guy getting in to your systems, right? Privacy breach is really a lot scarier, quite frankly, uh, especially for small companies. We hear a lot from smaller companies that I'm not a target, you know, no hackers, uh, they're not interested in me, I don't hold a bunch of uh, credit card information. Privacy breach is a, is a mistake. I mean, it can be an error by an employee. And true story, we had a smaller client uh, a couple of years ago that went through this. They were renewing their um, employee benefits. One one. They had all their information on all their employees that was going back and forth between their vendors, and they had an employee that sent a massive spreadsheet with every one of their employees, <coughs> um, a few thousand, sent it to the wrong address, sent it to the wrong email address. That triggered every law in terms of a privacy breach because that information is out there on every employee, and they spent months and months dealing with that simple situation of somebody sending the wrong email. So that's a privacy breach, and again, I think that's less scary for a lot of companies um, if, you, if you aren't as worried about, about the security side of it. Uh, privacy regulatory, I kind of talked about that already. Um, the, we list a few more on the privacy event expense reimbursement. Um, you know, one more comment about that. You've probably all read, there's a lot of publication out there about you know helping companies quantify what a loss could cost you. And in this, this you know, the liability side is a little more difficult, right? Because what, what could a lawsuit cost you? That's a little more difficult to quantify. But on these privacy event expenses, you could read five articles, and those five articles are going to tell you five different things in terms of what an average cost would be. But there's a lot of information out there about average cost per record. So if you have a thousand employees and you have a privacy breach and you suffer through all of these expenses, what is that going to cost you? You know, you'll read articles saying that it could be five dollars per record, anything up to two hundred dollars per record. And we spend a lot of time in consulting with our clients to really help them narrow that. But but it is true. It it very much depends on the sophistication of the loss. Um, and how many employees are affected or how many customers are affected, that's what's going to really quantify what your loss is going to cost you. And we do spend a lot of time consulting on that point. So the first party, this would be the business interruption that I spoke about, um, but a couple of other attributes here separate from the liability. Uh, data electronic information loss, um, this is, is basically just cost of recovering the data that was breached or that was destroyed or manipulated. Uh, the business interruption we spoke about. And the last one is cyber extortion. Um, you know, this is somebody that's actually
actually uh, has gotten into your system, they've infiltrated, and they are basically coming to you saying, hey, we're in. We have access to all of your uh, corporate information. We have access to all of your employee information. And pay you $5 million or I'm going to post it. Um, and we, we definitely have seen those losses.
that's the biggest conversation in a banking environment. A very good friend of mine uh, is a VP for a very large bank. And I mean, they are inspecting and identifying every piece of data that goes out on any email to identify exactly what that is. You know, and depending upon the type of industry, some companies we've worked with have done it based upon, you know, so if you start talking designs and proprietary information, documentation like that, usually those are fairly large, so they'll set thresholds on how big a piece of data can leave, right? So some companies do it that way, others sniff all email. Yeah, there, there is software in the that will look for social security numbers. The social security numbers yeah, are a specific yeah. string of numbers that dashes and that recognize the block.
that. So follow the map. So follow the math with me on this one, if you would please. So in 1996, what year is it, what year is it now? 2016. How many years ago? 20 years ago? <clears throat> I plugged a router in for the first time in a home network. And in the first hour, there were 250 <coughs> attacks against that router. It showed up as a new IP address. The people think that there are people out there doing this. There are script feeds that they, they call, where they write scripts, and they're just looking for a new IP address that comes online. And then they launch dedicated attacks against it. This isn't somebody that knows you, that doesn't like you, that is out there trying to do something to you. This is an anonymous group, such as anonymous, out there really trying to um, run these scripts against you. The question about uh, the wire transfer, there was a client of ours that was a mortgage acceleration system. Um, no hack was made, but they were able to time a system that they had built by a different company where they would, uh, somebody would make a payment to a loan, and they knew how the system worked just enough so that as soon as the payment was being processed, they canceled the transaction with the company. The money went through, but the transaction was canceled, and they bled $250,000 out of this company without them even knowing about it. So it, it, it happens. Another story, um, back to the, the risk uh, with that. The wire transfer, we know another company, $250,000 wire transfer, they were not covered because they clicked the button that initiated the wire transfer. The, the insurance carrier said, that nothing really happened here. You got a notice, you, you transferred the money. So you need to look at things like the crime uh, liability and things like that. So this is all around you. Uh, think about it in your personal lives. Uh, you don't want to post a picture on Facebook. Here's me dragging my suitcase out of the car. Here's me at the airport. Here's me in California. You know, and uh, this is going to be a great two week vacation. Well, fantastic. Uh, there's the United Postal Service website where you go to website, you go to shut down your mail, it's it's a hacker site, and they know, okay, you're shutting down your mail, when are you going to pick it back up? I've got a week to try and break into your home. So it's all around you. It is scary. Uh, how many emails do you get that say, hey, your shipment has arrived from UPS, and you think, I, I didn't get a shipment, or if you travel a lot, here are your tickets on Northwest, well, I'm flying Southwest, so I'm going to open this attachment from Northwest and see what it is. So that social aspect of the social engineering, you can't stop it for that very reason. You can't stop somebody from not knowing to open an attachment or doing something silly that they think is just something. I got a Facebook request one day and I thought, I don't know that guy. I'm going to click on that link and I thought, wait a minute, I don't know that guy. I moused over the link. You know how you can mouse over the link in your email? You can see the actual link. It wasn't Facebook at all. It was a phishing scheme. So educating your people, educating your vendors, educating your customers, that's the biggest thing that you can do because there's all kinds of firewalls, there's all kinds of security patches, there's everything out there that you can imagine, but we are the weakest link in the chain, unfortunately. So when you get an email that comes in and you're not sure who it's from, go click on it. Take a look at it. One last question, please. Oh, right. I have another question. I know this, maybe this is something pretty remedial, but in Outlook, when you've got that preview pane for emails, is that technically already open if you can see that? And I've never seen still older if I have opened it. Because to me, that's going to give you more information before you click on an Outlook email. But I don't know if that, if that window pane is open, if you technically really open up an email, that information is available. Yeah, the reading pane? Yeah, if there's a script that's built into the email that runs automatically when you open the email and you have the reading pane on, it will automatically execute your script. We require that everybody in our company shut the reading pane off on the inbox. They can leave it open in the junk mail. They can leave it open on file and folders and things like that, but it will automatically execute that script. Okay. So nice job, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for Tom from the Salvation Army. Please take a look on your table. There is the Salvation Army sheet on there. Uh, if you, even if you can't contribute right now, please take it with you and uh, do so. One last thing, there is the, uh, the MML event survey on your desks. Please, this is very important to us. This helps us uh, to know the next location. The next speakers and things.